ancient capital of Japan. A city where a thousand years of history and art live side by side. Kyoto wouldn't be what it is without the contributions of craftsmen. Master artisans honing their skills over a millennium have made the city a place of exceptional beauty. Japan's imperial family has helped to nurture their artistry. A clan with a history stretching back 2,000 years, the imperial family has taken numerous craftsmen under its patronage. These artisans created works of the utmost quality that now form a treasured collection. A number of extraordinary artworks were produced during the Meiji period, starting in the late 19th century. Japan's feudal system had ended, and trade with other countries resumed for the first time in 200 years. National prestige was riding on the skills of the craftsmen and their masterpieces. Many of the techniques they used are now shrouded in mystery, and even modern technology cannot recreate the quality of their work. Then people suddenly realized, my goodness, Japanese craftsmen can produce the type of things that we can't produce in the West. The government placed high value on the artworks, as they were important earners of foreign currency. In this turbulent era, Japan's craftsmen gave their all to create exquisite treasures. We'll unveil the little-known drama behind the imperial collection of the finest Japanese artworks. family has had a great role in supporting Japanese art. On display here is a prized collection the imperial household has gathered and kept under lock and key. The aim is to protect and pass down the superb skills of master craftsmen from generation to generation. These are all masterpieces, but the ones collected during the Meiji period are a cut above. This vase, with its design of birds and flowers, is said to be among the finest examples ever made of cloisonné enamel. Beautiful scenes from the four seasons in Japan float above jet black darkness. The Japanese word for cloisonné is shippo. It's a Buddhist term meaning seven treasures. People started using the word to refer to enamel work, relating it to precious materials like gold, silver, and lapis lazuli. This remarkable cloisonné was created by a man who had never studied art. His name is Yasuyuki Namikawa. Namikawa had served a noble family. Seeing great business potential in Cloisonne, he set up a studio in his home and started making enamel objects. At the time in Kyoto, Cloisonne was enjoying an unprecedented surge in popularity. Techniques of Cloisonne making used to be guarded by designated families, but the secrets started leaking out after the collapse of the feudal structure with the shogun at the top. More than 40 cloisonné shops had opened in the city. A new industry was emerging. Cloisonné manufacture is an extremely delicate, time-consuming craft. An artisan outlines a design by placing thin strips of silver on a metal object that serves as a base. Then, little by little, 
he applies enamel paste, finely ground glass colored with metal oxides. The process requires meticulous attention to detail. The workers that Namikawa gathered were all former warriors and Buddhist priests who had lost their jobs after the end of the samurai system. They had to do everything through trial and error. Three months later, they had completed their very first object. With this small piece as a first step, Namikawa started linking himself to cloisonne making. His cloisonne gradually became popular, and he managed to get his business rolling. His success eventually caught the attention of the government. He was asked if he'd like to sell his enamel works abroad. At the time, Japan was facing a crisis. Western powers were strengthening their presence in Asia. But Japan was still a fledgling modern nation and could have been invaded and colonized at any time. The government needed money to build a country strong enough to withstand the threat from the industrialized states. So Japanese officials wanted to export cloisonne and other artworks to earn foreign currency. Thanks to this environment, Namikawa was able to expand his workshop. He now employed some 50 artisans. Hello, long time no see. Then one day, disaster struck. One of his clients, a foreign trader, delivered the blow. Unfortunately, I'd like to cancel our deals. Cancel? Why? Your cloisonne is so poorly made. I can't find any buyers. Namikawa was stunned. Eventually, a dejected Namikawa received a letter from the merchant as a token of apology for ending their contract. He invited Namikawa to an exhibition in Tokyo. When Namikawa made his way to the capital, he was overwhelmed by what he saw. It was an artwork from a major cloisonne production center in a central province then called Owari. The piece was far more beautiful than his own creations. He recognized immediately that his skills were no match. He later said, It shocked me. I learned that I was just a big fish in a little pond. No wonder my pieces weren't selling. After returning to Kyoto, he assembled his workers. He felt he'd hit his limit as an enameler. 
and wanted to start from scratch. Namikawa worked around the clock in his quest for perfection. He put special focus on enamels, the key to the beauty of cloisonné. Enamels are a mix of glass and metal. Depending on how they are blended, the resulting enamel can take on various colors. These are some enamel samples created by Namikawa. Just to make green, he experimented with myriad combinations. He devoted himself to honing his skills so that he could easily manipulate many colors. Eventually, Namikawa created these pieces. They were singular achievements with bright, gorgeous hues. The imperial household took note of Namikawa's creations. In 1897, by command of the Meiji Emperor, the Imperial Household Agency commissioned the leading artisans, including Namikawa, to create the most exquisite works. They were eyeing the Paris Universal Exposition. Forty countries were to exhibit at the international event. They believed winning a claim there would give Japan's art exports a boost. Ordered to submit his work for the exposition, Namikawa decided on a bold move. He resolved to astonish the world with black cloisonné. At the time, there existed enamel works that were said to be black, but they were actually more dark blue. No one believed a truly beautiful black cloisonné could be created. Why weren't black enamels being produced? There was a big technical hurdle. Using the methods of Namikawa's time, a present-day artisan tried to create black cloisonné. The kiln burns at about 1,200 degrees Celsius. It's a melting pot of glass and metal, a fusion that becomes enamel. Before Namikawa, no one had made black enamel. Craftsmen back then didn't even know what materials were needed to produce it. Even now, making black enamel is considered a difficult challenge. Minute fluctuations in temperature and humidity can affect the resulting color. Artisans have only their experience and intuition to rely on. If it comes out well, it produces a beautiful hue and luster. But it's hard. Not many want to do it. Making black enamel is like climbing one mountain after another. Namikawa tried every possible ingredient he could think of to create black enamel. Using trial and error, he mixed countless batches. Finally, he succeeded in producing a jet black enamel. A black background allows a design to stand out sharp and clear.
A modern vase, covered with enamel paste, goes into the kiln. Now, the black enamel starts showing its true colors. The modern day artisan removes the piece exactly five minutes later. The black hue has emerged murky and uneven. He says it's because he pulled the vase out a few seconds too soon. Unlike other colors, black enamel doesn't allow for any mistakes. Everything must go perfectly. Some craftsmen are said to even be fearful about working with black, believing that it harbors something evil. Namikawa himself kept fighting the darkest color. He kept making endless samples over and over to create the kind of black enamel he dreamed of. Finally, he succeeded in creating this black cloisonne. was displayed at the exposition in Paris, attracting tremendous interest among people from many countries. In search of Namikawa's black, individuals from around the world came to visit his workshop. Japan's overseas shipments of fine arts and crafts like cloisonne were expanding steadily. They came to account for 10% of the nation's total exports in value. When high quality pieces were, had become available, then people suddenly realized, my goodness, Japanese craftsmen can produce the type of things that we can't produce in the West. So in fact, we started to copy um, in, in some ways. were helping to boost Japan's presence in the world soon after the country had opened its doors. The imperial household was commissioning work to nurture more craftsmen. It gave them increasingly challenging assignments to advance their skills to the highest levels possible. one of their achievements. Chrysanthemum flowers, the imperial symbol, are rendered across its surface in powdered gold. Flying among the golden flowers are small rainbow-colored birds. The decorative technique involved inlaying mother of pearl cut from the inside of a seashell. It took 13 years to complete this cabinet. During that time, dozens of artisans were engaged in the production. This helped heighten their skills and allowed various techniques to be passed down from one generation of craftsmen to the next. One of the pieces in the Imperial collection saved a traditional industry that was struggling during the Meiji period. This is that artwork, 
six meters wide and three meters tall. It's exceptionally large among the imperial treasures. The tapestry depicts a fantastic world of birds and flowers of every season in full bloom. It was created by a Kyoto-based artisan named Jinbei Kawashima. This work is not painted with a brush. It's actually woven. The depiction is so elaborate, it looks like a painting. And it's this artistry that is said to have saved Japan's textile industry from a crisis. The factory that made this huge tapestry is still operational in Kyoto. Believe it or not, this is a single loom that's 24 meters wide. It mainly produces curtains for large halls. To create patterns, threads of various colors are woven into vertical strands of white thread. Everything is done manually. It's very hard work, but I feel great when I'm done. There's a wonderful sense of accomplishment. But size isn't the factory's only feature. Its craftsmen have the skills to express subtle shadings of color. It was the company's leader, Jinbei Kawashima II, who came up with the technique. Many people view Kawashima as a legendary hero who saved Japan's textile industry. In the late 19th century, Western culture was beginning to take root in Japan. The government was encouraging women to wear Western-style clothing. This dealt a heavy blow to Japan's traditional textile industry. Textiles were Japan's core industry, but rapid Westernization was forcing many makers to close shop. Worried about the future, this second generation owner of a textile factory in Kyoto decided to do something. Kawashima looked overseas for a route to survival. He spent 40 days aboard a ship to get to France, a major cultural center. His aim was to learn about the European textile business. What he found there was a completely different way of using textile products than in Japan. Sofas, carpets, and curtains to decorate windows. Textiles were being used as interior furnishings. Kawashima wondered, couldn't we sell Japanese textiles here? After returning to Japan, something else caught his attention. Japanese-style paintings. They commonly depicted birds and flowers, but such designs were mostly absent in Western textiles. Kawashima decided to create textiles with intricately colored scenes of nature.
He aimed to make uniquely Japanese textiles, unlike any that existed overseas. It was the only way to compete. That's why he started making pieces based on Japanese paintings. But Kawashima faced a major challenge. Textile techniques to express the delicate gradations of Japanese paintings had yet to exist. Kawashima struggled. He dyed the yarn in various colors, but failed to produce seamless gradations. Then, one of his craftsmen offered an idea. What if we merge yarns of different colors into one? It was from this spur-of-the-moment notion that a revolutionary yarn was created. Called warimoku, it's a yarn of blended colors. It's made by splitting two yarns of adjacent colors in half and then twisting them together. This creates a single yarn of a median color between the two. Kawashima and his colleagues began to weave textiles with warimoku. In one fabric after another, they produced delicate color gradations never before seen. A seamless progression from light pink to white on peony petals. A faint hint of moss on the trunk of a tree. Fabric had now reached a new high in expression of a kind not even found in paintings. Kawashima's fabric was shown at the World's Fair in Liège, Belgium. It won the Grand Prix. The global recognition prompted the imperial family to purchase his work. Orders started to pour in from other countries. The Peace Palace in The Hague, Netherlands. One of its chambers is known as the Japanese Room because its walls are covered with Kawashima fabric. Kawashima introduced his fabric to the world. His accomplishment not only helped revive Japan's textile industry, but also impressed people around the globe with the technical finesse of Japanese artisans. Gagaku, or Japanese Imperial Court Music and Dance, has been passed down over a thousand years under the patronage of the Imperial family. The mystic art is a fusion of Japan's ancient music and dancing and their Asian counterparts. Ryo O is a Gagaku classic. The music is about a Chinese military commander, Ran Ryo O, who was so handsome, it was said that in battles he had to wear a mask to keep his troops from becoming distracted. He is depicted in this extraordinary ornament.
called Bugaku Dancer Ranryo O. The figure is made entirely of metal. Even the costume, which looks like leather, is metal. Assembled from hundreds of parts, it's considered a masterpiece of metalwork. Standing 34 centimeters tall and weighing about five kilograms, the tiny figure packs a host of amazing metal crafting techniques. Costume folds are reproduced with astonishing realism. To make these, the artisan had to painstakingly hammer out a copper plate. On the cast metal fringe, even the motion of individual tassels is expressed. But how were each of these parts assembled? More than 120 years after the figure was made, the answer remains lost in mystery. The creator of this enigmatic metalwork is Shonin Unno. Shomin was a metal carving master who carved sword fittings like hand guards. But with the Meiji Restoration and Japan's transition from a warrior-centered society into a modern state, samurai swordsmen had lost their jobs. Metal workers saw their clients evaporate even Shonin was forced to struggle. He sunk deeper and deeper into debt and even had trouble buying enough food. One after another, his peers moved on to other careers. But Shonin hung on. I am determined to become the top metal craftsman in Japan. Shonin willingly accepted any carving work, no matter how minor. The jobs included engraving tobacco pipes and other objects he'd never worked on before in his life. Having been patronized by noble warriors, many metal carving masters looked down on working for civilians. But that's where Shonin sought opportunities Yet taking advantage of them was not easy. Unlike flat surfaces such as hand guards, three-dimensional objects require highly sophisticated engraving techniques. The only way to master the craft was to learn by trial and error. Shomin immersed himself in engraving. Every night, he wouldn't put down his chisel till dawn. As a result, his craftsmanship was refined to a level of fine art. Here is an example from that time period. If you look closer, you'll see that the knob of the vessel's lid is a butterfly 
carved to capture the instant it alighted on a peony. Just two centimeters across, the butterfly is precisely executed, from its antennae and hair to the lines on its wings. Gradually, Shoming gained fame as a master artisan. Then, in 1890, he staked his career on a major event. The third National Industrial Exhibition was an arena for artisans around the country to show their works. All eyes in Japan were on the expo. Shomin entered his figure of Ranryo into the prestigious exhibit. He had given three years in all his strength to complete the masterpiece. Exploiting his skills to the maximum, the work showed an unprecedented level of expression in three-dimensional engraving. were ecstatic. They noted that the techniques used are beyond difficult and unmatched by any other metal craftsman of the time. Twelve decades after the creation of Ranryo-o, there is an artisan poised to replicate some of Shomin's sublime techniques. Sogo Torita is a metal craftsman with more than 50 years of experience. He once worked with the Imperial Household Agency to investigate the Ranryo-o. When he saw the actual piece for the first time, he couldn't believe his eyes and its ingenious craftsmanship. I was astonished. I marveled at what human hands can do. And I was more moved than I'd expected to be. I thought there was no way we could ever replicate it. It would take ages and a plan. Every single thing would have to be mapped out, including the assembly process. It would take years to get done. Torita said he would try to recreate the patterns of clouds decorating Randio O's costume. The process uses an advanced technique of embedding metal in metal. It begins with carving a cavity in a base copper plate. The plate is only 1.2 millimeters thick. Any lapse in force control would result in rupture. At this point, the edge is raised. In a normal procedure, the edge is leveled only after the other metal is embedded, so as to fix it in place. But that leaves slightly uneven seams around the edge when it's leveled off. Torita says, in Ran Rio O, all edges were leveled before embedment. So now, each rough edge is filed thoroughly. But leveling the edges first makes the opening too small for the other piece to be embedded directly. It must be bent to fit the opening.
It's then inserted and hammered out. This method allows the base metal and the embedded metal to align perfectly, leaving elegant seams. Hard metal is heated, which softens it so that it can be adjusted repeatedly until it fits the cavity to a T. This painstaking process was employed for all of the more than 100 patterns on the figure. It's a flawless work. Torita believed that Anario O was beyond what is humanly possible. It's flawless, no matter where you look. I'm convinced it was created to demonstrate the sum total of the creator's abilities. When he made this, I think he wanted to leave evidence of his mastery, no matter the cost. In replicating the masterpiece, one thing Torita had particular trouble figuring out was the motifs on the figure's three-dimensional surfaces. These would require inlaying of metal along the undulating folds of the costume. In addition, there are layers of patterns embedded within patterns. These are just several millimeters wide. Torita says even today's top metal craftsmen cannot reproduce them. The craftsmanship in Ranryo O it's a priceless treasure that unites perfect command of metalworking with the strong will of its creator. In rapidly changing Japan of the late 19th and early 20th century, master artisans honed their skills. In ceramics alone, their skill is unrivaled. This densely decorated incense burner is satsuma ware, a type of pottery that became hugely popular overseas during the Meiji period. First produced as giftware for feudal lords, satsuma's base color was originally a creamy white. But with the demise of the feudal system, makers of the ware lost their main customer base and kilns began closing one after another. Desperate for survival, potters pursued attention-grabbing designs As a result, the hallmark white porcelain became covered with innumerable decorations. This ornate design was well received in Western countries. Satsuma became a sought after brand name, attracting collectors around the world. But the golden age of master artisans competing with each other didn't last long. As the Meiji period drew to a close, the Japanese Russo War broke out, 
changing the political and social situation. Yasuyuki Namikawa, the creator of the Cloisonne masterpiece, ended up becoming a supplier of medals of honor under orders of the government. In 1923, dwindling sales of cloisonne finally forced Namikawa to close his workshop. Shomin Uno stunned the world with his figure of Randryo O. He later lost his son to whom he had passed down all of his skills. Then Shomin himself came down with illness. Even the most prominent craftsman couldn't resist the currents of the times. But their passion and spirit are still alive and well, more than a century later. What's known today as the Tokyo University of the Arts is where Shomin used to teach. Students here learn metalworking skills passed down from the golden era. on their graduation assignments. into the world of craftsmanship. Artisans refined their skills to a new pinnacle in the brief span of the Meiji period. Sublime pieces of art emerged from the turbulent years and helped build Japan as a modern nation. The techniques that astonished the world are passed down over generations in the masterpieces of the imperial collection. Irreplaceable treasures that embody the vision and passion of their master craftsmen.